All right, everybody. Um, welcome to Quantitative Brainstorm Mean Reversion uh, for something completely different. As always, I will begin with our disclaimer. Disclaimer, not financial advice. Only my own and other speakers' opinions. This is not to encourage nor promote taking any trades, positions, or investments of any kind. Any information contained in this conversation is for informational purposes only and to be taken as is. Derek Wong and other speakers have done their best to ensure accurate information. Regardless of anything to the contrary, nothing available in this conversation should be understood as a recommendation. Consult a licensed financial professional in your jurisdiction. This, record, this conversation will be recorded and posted for future reference. So as always, this is an open discussion. Raise your hand if you would like to come to the stage. Um, I think we're going to have a completely different set of people uh, today uh, than our normal crew. So I guess I'll open up kind of with the highlights of mean reversion and my general thoughts, and then we can use that to, um, you know, as, as a jumping off point. So. Uh, most of the world runs on mean reversion trading uh, in previous episodes, or not, not episodes, but clubhouses. I've discussed how, you know, uh, fixed all fixed income instruments uh, because they will either revert to par or go to zero um, are, is mean reverting FX as well. Um, basically, you're measuring the carry between two uh, different uh, rates. Uh, based on the central banks of these two countries, and that has mean reverting properties. Any kind of cross-sectional equities strategy, portfolio generating strategy uh, that you see in factor space um, tends to have some kind of mean reversion property. Uh, equities people, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, because normally you're neutralizing the market. So you're, you're market neutral and you're, you're, you're taking something there. Now, if your advantage is plus or minus some alpha uh, against that, our value, um, value is going to your uh, estimated value of a company and hence is also a mean reverting trade. Um, some basic academic background behind some people use correlation to see if things are related. A level up from that is co-integration and that looks for the statistical properties um, of these two and to see if you know they're mean reverting it. Uh, I guess I can we can get into the mass if you want um, but it's a stronger relationship it is t-testable um, you can get a p-value out of it uh, while correlation uh, not so much and then finally um, talking about other potential strategies where you may see mean reversion, but uh, you know may not realize that it is mean reversion, is uh, in curves trading. Uh, this happens a lot on fixed income desks. Again, um, the yield curve is a great place to do um, this type of mean reversion trading. Um, futures curves as well. Anyone generating carry from contango or backwardation uh, is doing some kind of mean reversion against spot and the forward expectation and that decays um, until we, we get a deliverable spot. So in fact, if you are taking any position in a future, um, there is a component of, of this uh, mean reversion occurring in your position, whether you like it or not. And then finally, um, another place that uh, we can look at it is, is just outright pairs trading. So. Outright pairs trading is the idea that you can take um, asset A and asset B. You find that they are, quote, mean reverting. You can use uh, any method you want in the standard uh, literature. It is co-integration. And then you can say, okay, when these two things, which create a spread, which will be a synthetic asset that you are trading, when this spread deviates from its uh, normal range, then uh, we would like to take a position on this. And so that's kind of like a general overview of how it's used. Um, again, uh, kind of the main broad brushstrokes are a relationship between two things. 
and most things that generate some kind of carry are mean reverting. I'm not sure if I'll classify short volatility as mean reversion. Um, implied versus realized is definitely some kind of mean reversion, but you have some expectation that implied will collide with uh, realized, which is similar to kind of the effect we see in, in futures curves and yield curves. So I will leave it there and open it up to the audience and uh, kind of see what everybody thinks. Hi to everyone. Great to meet all of you, as always. I want to say that I was uh, doing my research on this topic. Uh, not all of these topics, of course, but partly. And I came to the conclusion that many reversion systems, and I said before this, my point that many reversion systems, they are not robust enough, at least for me. So, if we have a trend, if we have a trend following strategy, and we have trend trending environment, uh, with a very high probability, we will have profit. Not in all un under all circumstances, but very high probability of our profit. But if we have mini version strategy and we have fletchish period, this probability of being in profit is much lower because the robustness is lower. So we can face such situation that we have a drawdown uh, in a trended environment and after this we have a fletchish environment and we have another drawdown or maybe uh, not much profit that you will not recover from your last drawdown. And I have seen such situation in my research. Thanks for that comment, Oleg. Um, but I, I will counter your point because uh, the strategies that will have the most probability of profit at any given point in time will be mean reversion strategies. I They have higher win rates in general. Um, in general, uh, you will see more consistent uh, returns on a daily, monthly, or even annual basis. And uh, that is not a property that, uh, as you mentioned, trend following has. However, um, if we think about this robustness idea and the idea of drawdown, it's purely that the strategy is negative skew. And, you know, in trend following or long volatility, that's a positive skew strategy. You have a negative skew strategy. And what that means is um, normally if you have a profitable mean reversion strategy, the mean will be on the positive side of zero. Well, in a trend following strategy, your mean will probably be on the negative side of zero. You're going to be taking a lot more small losers and your win rate is going to probably be less than 50%. While in a mean reversion strategy, you will be on the top side of 50%. And actually, um, in the words of compounding, uh, this accelerates your compounding much faster. You're able to accelerate your Kelly criterion, your exponential growth uh, factor um, increases massively. Dealing with the drawdowns, dealing with risk mitigation actually comes with a totally other set of tactics that um, are not necessarily the same as trend following except position sizing. And that's just from my experience in research, but um, I think uh, that kind of clears up my, my side on your comment, Oleg. Um, I was telling about my own opinion and about my own research, and I understand that it might be not perfect, of course. But uh, this is my point. I have maybe in the five or six years, I had a few periods of research on this topic and have the same result and with different knowledge I returned, different level of knowledge I returned to this topic and I did not find good decision. I wanted to do so, I wanted to have a long-term strategy, uh, trend following strategy from medium to long term and I wanted to have short-term mean reversion system. So, in our first period, uh, to have profit from mean reversion system and at least uh, to 
to reduce drawdown at least. But in fact, I didn't find a good solution for this, and I didn't find solution for this to be to make. Uh, I didn't find why it makes sense to me to do my trading activity more complex because I didn't did not see that it's perfect. It's at least my opinion. I agree with the, the fact that at the end of the day strategies and trades are very personal but I you know what Derek was, was saying and was implying is, is the fact that um, you can combine heavily positively skewed trades with a mildly negative negatively skewed um, strategy and achieve a better overall outcome without getting into uh, you know the much dreaded and you know for lack of better words and and for what it's worth you know um, I I agree with with all of that you know um, equity um, curve management or equity curve or smooth, uh, smoothing which which is you know the road to perdition to a certain extent but you know you can temper um, positive, you know, the, the head the, some of the negative traits of um, of a very good strategy like trend following and a very positively skewed uh, suite of trades with some negatively um, with, with you know with carry and some negative or near reverting strategies and again get an overall better outcome at portfolio level. Um, this requires obviously optimization requires all sorts of things that uh, don't sit very well with some people but the, the message from Derek and for me as well is that they can coexist and cohabit um, and it's actually probably better to to have a multi-strat approach than a single one um, and this is something you know I only speak for myself but um, uh, to counter all like what you're saying I think it actually gives you a little bit more tools uh, you know to, to weather the different environments and if you want we can, we can expand on these but you know not all negatively skewed trades are stupid trades Kind of to expand on that idea and, and the idea of carry um you know i'll keep it general i i don't really want to get into the battle between mean reversion and trend following um i agree with bruno i mean i am a multi-strategy manager and this is an approach that i believe in um but that the idea of anything that's generating carry probably either has some shortfall component or has some mean reverting component or maybe some hybrid of the two and um, having another type of return stream in your business or in your life is probably beneficial, especially because it has different statistical properties. So if we're talking about um, creating a portfolio of strategies, having something with a different return profile, a different skewness, a different um, you know, returns after they've been transformed through, you know, as, as I think, you know, the, the strategies are, are return transforming machines, that synthetic asset that you get at the end, um, actually massively increases your diversification between things, just because it's going to be so different from um, if you have a majority trend following portfolio. So I, again, like if we think about adding more instruments to something and you think about having this other aspect that is taking those same instruments you're already connected to, providing data to, you know, the scalability to be able to do that and create really, really decorrelated um, synthetic returns out from the, that, that transformed asset, I think is something that can't be overlooked. And we know that the more diversification you take, um, the less risky that overall net portfolio is going to be. So that does help mitigate this, um, downside deviation from this one single strategy. Now there are people who do just um, mean reversion on their own. Uh, I, I will uh, you know, say Jim Simmons is majority of his stuff, uh, if, at least in the, the book, um, is mean reversion. So some of the most successful, like top class people out there focus their time and their energy on this style of trade. So to dismiss it out of hand, I think is a bit, well, just dismissive. 
Why does it feel like we're talking about religion? This part I don't know, Brian. I, I have <laughs> tried to fight back against this as much as I can. I try to keep this this um, clubhouse here as open to ideas as possible. But I do believe uh, it's like a religion because, okay, how do I say it? Like, how do I say it? when people come to a, a, a trading methodology or have researched something, they've put their blood, sweat, and tears into something, and they've realized that this is now their truth. And I use the word their truth. And that is almost uh, religious-like, religion-like. And um, the idea is that, uh, you know, if you had to go through all that to do it, you're going to staunchly defend it because if someone is challenging your basic belief and something that you've built your ego on, then we have a whole other question. But if you keep your mind open to other possibilities, which is a lot more humbling, um, then potentially... Uh, you can add something. Now, of course, with any kind of discourse, you can take or leave what you want. But to to battle it uh, in a zealotous way, I, I think, is is really overdoing things and, 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 and stamps out creativity. I mean, I think that's what we're all here for is, is interesting discourse that can, you know, spark an idea in our heads. I, I was going to contribute that I... Definitely have seen the power of mean reverting strategies, and you know, at, at like a ninety-two percent effective rate <laughs> over the year um, in statistical arbitrage is is what what I came up with. Um, so I, I can I can preach that it does occur, and now as a um, I would consider my strategy closer to trend following than mean reversion. So they both work, guys. <laughs> um, and I think the sweet spot is finding how to, like, why. Uh, I think they're in very different products. Um, I think the mean reversion is, in, very, in my experience, just very quantitative, um, complex trades. And the, um, I guess you could call it trend following, but the opposite of mean reversion is, it seems to be in simpler trades, such as being long a certain future uh, or short of a certain future. And um, I, I, you know, I, but I, I think it would be very difficult to do a mean reversion in the S&P futures. I, you know, I see people trying to do it and it works until it <laughs> until the trend following kicks in, um, you know, that you can draw as many lines on a chart as you want. And it's not going to go back sometimes to where it was. Um, so I, I, I think that's the distinction is a more quantitative, complex uh, instrument. It's, it's, it's a lot easier than a simple um, by being long or short a future. Andy, thank you for that. Um, but you said something that kind of, uh, you know, brought an idea to mind, and that's the idea that a lot of, I mean, I will use the word retailers or independent traders believe that you can mean revert a single asset, a single time series, whether that's your S&P or a single stock or something like that. And that's not the case. What you had um, very poignantly uh, discussed was that this is a relationship between multiple things, and that's what makes it complicated. You, in, in the mean reversion world, at least you know, in my experience, um, you're trading relationships, and to try to find the mean reversion in a single time series, like I imagine, like, okay, um, this is not trading advice. This is just some random toy example I'm coming up with on the fly. Like if you threw Bollinger Bands on the S&P 500, and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm going to buy this do standard deviation thing. I'm going to sell this thing. It's not going to work. You're going to blow up because a single time series um, does not have those kinds of neutralizing properties, uh, and it will at one point trend. And we know that trends will occur in other things, and that's what's going to blow you out. So um, I think that's kind of a key point to shift people's ideas of what where mean reverting works and where mean reverting probably doesn't work um, is to, to kind of uh, highlight that point. Thank you, Andy. 
Sure. And it, it's frustrating to no end. You know, I, I, I do focus primarily in the S and P futures and I see so many people, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I, I'm sure they're not in here, but just, I want to say charlatans you know, drawing levels, you know, Oh, it's, it's going to bounce off here. It's going to bounce off here or it might not. And it, it's, it, people, people want so badly to mean revert, uh, you know, S and P futures in, in, in my world. And it's, it's, you know, and it works until it doesn't, and then it blows out and then someone creates a new Twitter account and then it starts working again. It's, it's hard to watch. It's like a slow motion train wreck. Hi, can I ask you something? Do you think that a uh, mean reversion works on its own or it just works when mixed with some other strategy like a divergent strategy on a full portfolio uh, because um, sometimes what, what I see is that to make it work you have to do pairs etc and then have implicit leverage and that will be risky for the strategy but that risk on its own could be very big but mixed in a portfolio is a, a little uh, better uh, easier to handle so do you think that uh, co convergence strategies, mean reverse strategies, work on their own? Yeah, definitely. I also agree. Um, and again, it's like, if you pull, pull, pull the part out on its own, it's about what product you are trying to create or what kind of portfolio you're gonna create. I mean, if that's uh, the type of return stream that you want, of course, it's going to work on your own. And, and it's going to have its pros and cons and statistical properties, I mean, uh, as as with any kind of strategy. So um, is that risks you're willing to take on, first of all? And if so, are you going to get paid enough to take on those risks? And then you can make your decision. Yes, what I found, I found out is that there are some uh, mean reversion or, or let's say convergence strategies with I don't know I, I don't know if it's the same that they kind of work if you use leverage but then again you have to level, uh, level it down on your whole portfolio uh, to make it work in a safe mode for example uh, a strategy that you said that you didn't want, uh, you didn't think uh, if it was or not mean reversion which was uh, for example um, selling options on the S&P 500 selling options on the S&P 500 that, that that gives me a, a, a little bit of uh, anxiety even hearing that I think there's, there's a distinction to make between um, a strategy, and that's not about more reversion or, um, or, or trend following, any kind of strategy um, and, and the limits or the boundaries within which it works. Uh, if you need to lever up um, you know, something 20, 30, 40 times um, in order to extract a meaningful return, uh, that in and of itself is a different question um, as to you know the property of the underlying or the dynamics of the underlying return stream. Um, in theory, if you like a trade, uh, if you like it, uh, um, you should like it. You know, what uh, independently of you know how much leverage you you know it comes with or you need to apply to it in order to extract your returns. So you know saying that mirror version trades, which is true. They are you know, executed with a lot of leverage, and sometimes that's where most of the problem is. But if it's true that mean reversion strategies are you know, interesting or good, they shouldn't really be any more interesting or any better because you can trade them with 20, 30, 50 tons of leverage rather than you know, um, a few. And it's, it's exactly the same thing for trend following. Trend following is an interesting strategy independently from the fact that actually using futures, you can pick up. Uh, 20, 30 uh, tons of leverage by the vehicle you're using you know, to execute those trades, the, the, the strategy. Um, and so it, the point about, you know, oh, mirror version is bad because of leverage is something that I don't really, um, you know, I don't really believe in. Uh, it could be that some, some, some Trump trades are just stupid 
in their own right. And yes, they are convergent. And yes, a lot of people blow up with, but that's not really to do with the fact that mean reversion or um, convergent or carry needs a lot of leverage to work. I mean, you know, I, I use, I can give my, my example, I use some carry strategies in, in, in futures and it's Derek was saying, it's all about you know, playing the contango of the backwardation, depending on you know, how curves are, are, are shaped. And you know, it's not a lot of, uh, um, a certain, so first of all, it doesn't require uh, any leverage on top of what the instruments are in order to work. But you know, it, it's, it's not a, uh, um, a trade that you know, makes sense only with futures. I mean, as Derek said, there's people that play interest rate curves up and down every day with cash bonds that have no leverage. Well, yeah, of course you can, you can repo them, but uh, you know, you can do unlevered trades that are mean reverting and you can do um, you know, divergent trades with a lot of leverage. I think leverage and, rever and, and mean reversion uh, should be kept separate basically. Um, and so it's difficult to answer the question in full. I think that brings an interesting point, actually, um, and that's, I, I guess I will term it uh, the risk premium embedded that you're getting in these mean reversion trades, uh, because I mean, people know that this mean reversion strategy exists. I, I, I mean, I'm apprehensive to call it pure alpha, um, but that the idea that this leverage idea and like how much you will return you will get with cash or leverage is the position sizing question. Right. And how do you formulate the position sizing question such that you will be able to handle the inevitable super drawdown? And I mean, you know, left tail risk, however you want to define it. Um, and I'm not talking like 95 VAR. We're talking like, you know, uh, 99, you know, expected shortfall or something. I, I don't want to throw out too many jargon out there, but like the actual expected value you will get um, for a left tail event or multiple consecutive left tail events. And is that return you will get at that correct position size, you know, beneficial to your portfolio or not? And that's a that's a portfolio construction question more so than a systems question or or uh, you know, you know, is this uh, effect repeatable? Um, because is having its own underlying dynamic that you're measuring over repeated samples in order to determine, you know, what this thing is. So um, I do feel like, uh, you know, Bruno understands me <laughs> pretty well and that, you know, these things can be easily conflated. Um, you can conflate the idea that someone blew up, um, you know, making a, a, a widow maker trade, like, like shorting uh, S and P options or, or, or shorting uh, natural gas uh, options. Uh, and and you know they think that the the IV will will converge with the the RV, um, but you know if he if the person did a one lot, you know like I mean the famous YouTube guy who blew up on natural gas, if he did a one lot, he still would have earned a, a profit. Would he have blown up his fund and you know had to cry on 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 YouTube as a meme? I don't think so. So th there is definitely some kind of 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 balance to be struck there. Yeah, and more to this point, you know, uh, we go back, um, I think uh, Brian was talking about religion, but, you know, I see in, in, um, in, what, in a lot of what Jerry says uh, that I, I don't practice because I can't practice because of my you know, philosophy or the way I built up my system, but I see a lot of value. You know, if you traded only 25 basis points of your capital for, you know, your five ATR or, you know, um, just do your own conversions, but basically, if if a moderately um, or moderately or if a, a certain size volatility shock only equates to twenty five basis points of your capital, I mean how 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 much of a disaster could that be? Not a lot. But but then you know in order to follow Jerry's approach, you have to to do exactly what he says. You have to make certain um, certain allocations in your capital different than than how people trade their own capital, certainly I do. So you have to have this idea of, you know, an equity that is there for, you know, a free to swing as much as you want and, and some other equity that you focus on versus, you know, uh, risk management only targets certain 
states of the world and sort of you know doesn't really worry about other states of the world so you know in on on you know the overall portfolio management and portfolio sizing is different than, than uh, how other people do it uh, and that's perfect uh, but you know what i am slightly a bit more um, wary of is is labeling negatively skewed trades as bad trades as, as Derek said some of them are really stupid but those are stupid trades pretty much like you know if if i went um and said okay i'm only going to buy uh 25 puts of the s p i mean unless i have you know a lot of money how you know how likely is it that i'm going to make it and make a fortune out of the s p crashing 20 75 percent i mean yeah it may happen it probably will will see that happening but you know i don't think it's a viable business proposition trying to sort of you know going for a specific um event and saying okay i'm gonna you know, bet all my money on that happening it, it's you know the, 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 so the point is you know labeling mean reverting trades or negatively skewed trades uh, stupid is the equivalent of saying, "Oh, I, you know, I, I only want to bet on a certain state of the world." And you know, unless you have infinite funds, which certainly I don't have, and not many people probably have, it's going, it's going to be a very, very uh, difficult trade to sort of you know, um, to see through, basically. So uh, the the point here is that we should make distinctions between what's stupid and you know other um, and what's not, and within what's not trying to figure out the, men, the merits of, of um, you know, concurrent approaches to what we do and, 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 and trying to improve what we do by looking at what others do and, uh, and trying to relate uh, you know, our own things to, to how other people do it. I mean, that's certainly why I've joined this, uh, these discussions, which are extremely productive. And Bruno, do you think that market making is uh, it's a mean reversion strategy and also one that that is a good business overall? Well, you should ask to um, Mr. JP Morgan and, and Mr. Goldman Sachs and Mr. Merrill Lynch. I mean, yes, market making can be transformed in a wonderful business. Yes, market making is a, a inherently short gamma business. Uh, but, you know, if you do it smartly, you can be very successful. Of course, market making requires scale. So another thing that we can say is, oh, maybe you should be careful with mean reverting trades because unless you have information advantage, which most of us certainly I don't believe um, we don't have. So you know I don't believe I have an information advantage. But you know if you don't have an information advantage, you have to have scale in order to have you know, success in mean reverting strategies. Uh, because it's true, what Richard, unfortunately, is not here today, but what R Richard and Jerry say is, show me a successful, uh, you know, convergent trader that has been in business as long as the, the biggest uh, trend, follower, trend followers have. And it's true. I mean, some of these strategies, are, the opportunity set is definitely limited in terms of, you know, longevity of those trades. So, you know, those that are successful and, you know, you brought up market makers are successful because they keep evolving and changing their business. That, that's the nature of a... Um, I mean, reverting business, you know, you have to kind of you know, wait for something to happen and then decide you know, where the convergence is going to take place and how. So um, market making is good, but, you know, it's not for everybody. And, and likewise, I think, you know, uh, another thing is um, mere reversion can be good, but it's certainly not for everybody. And I have a lot of respect for Oleg, for Barry, for Richard uh, that say it's not for us. So, you know, more power to them. Hey guys, one topic that you know, I, I struggle with, uh, and I'm curious, I think it crosses both mean reversion and trend following, is around ATR and the kind of commonly accepted principles of ATR. Uh, something I mentioned on, on one of the, the trend following call last week is the idea of having a formula that adjusts ATR to a current market condition for a given instrument, which could then, of course, be applied to a back test. And really the area that I'm struggling with or looking to study and explore is around variability of volatility. So if, if a, an instrument is $100 and there's a 10-period ATR of 
that is what we're looking at as truth. But in fact, if that $1 ATR has been radically transformed over the past five days and we're looking at a trailing 10 day where the five day ATR is $2, the 10 day ATR is $1, I think there's a lot of information there to be captured, which could inform the amount of risk that I should be taking on a future trade. And I'm curious how people think about the variability of ATR and how much risk is being applied when we're thinking of systematic trades. I'll, I'll field this one as, as best I can. So the, the first thing I'm gonna say is, um, let's strip back the idea of ATR and just talk about volatility and in and, and its purest sense. And I can give some examples of some of these kind of differentials that you might be talking about. Um, if you measure close to close volatility or you measure something like ATR, which takes into account intraday points, like the open, high, low, close, as opposed to just close to close, you're gonna get drastically different measures. And um, ATR will tend to be higher than the close to close because you know, you're know you gonna have extremes in the day that will be equalized by the time it's closed. Mostly um, days are not closing at their absolute tick high or tick low. I'm trying to get at the idea that uh, you know, volatility changes and kind of refactoring what you said, I, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking at a volatility estimation. I mean, we all are. The ATR today that you measure your price, uh, your, your position sizing on, you expect to be relatively similar to tomorrow's. And that's a pretty good bet because, um, you know, volatility is clustering. So, you know, if we're in a low vol regime, probability that tomorrow's gonna be a low vol regime is pretty high. Um, the issue comes around those jump points. Um, when you go from a low vol to high vol, or like in your example, when do you need to switch from a 10 to a 30 day um, look back uh, that would incorporate some of this, maybe potentially the last time we were in a high vol regime? Um, I think that's a holy grail question. I, I do, there, there, there are things like arch garch that 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 deal with that but am i am i phrasing that right jeff at first and then i can continue yeah the... i think we lost you jeff a 10 period and a 30 period atr and i average those to get what i expect to be a a blended approach to risk going forward so if in the the, the trailing two weeks there has been an increased volatility which is potentially leading to that breakout but historically, the ATR over the 30 period is going to be a little bit less. I'm kind of saying, okay, in this case, let's take a little bit less risk on this trade because historically it needs less room, but it's just getting active. Vice versa, obviously, would be the same case. If there's a lot of volatility, then you enter this contraction period. There may be a false assumption based on a 10-day ATR that would be more true when blended out over a longer period. So trying to capture both sides of that. And that, that's just something I think a lot about and, and going through texts and everything. I, I just don't really see that addressed much. Well, luckily, uh, volatility is a mean reverting process. Um, that is known. That is a stylized fact. So um, kind of the intuition, I think, is there. And, you know, kind of turning this into more financially terms or, or, or even um, machine learning terms, you're creating an ensemble method. You are not super sure that the 10, model, the 10 look back is like your right model, but you're all not, also not super sure like the 30 is your optimal model. So a blend of, of both will um, be better off than you know any one may or may not be true. I haven't um, researched that, but it is the idea between creating ensemble models. So um, that is a, a, an area of high research um, and also can be seen as a parallel to creating um, multiple trading strategies with the, with the same idea. So like the multiple look back and trend following or, or, or multiple different pairs creation um, for statistical arbitrage uh, is basically the same thing. And I think that, I mean, I don't know how, how good your research capability is, um, but since you're thinking about that thing, I do believe it is also testable. 
and there will be some re mean reversion action between your different uh, lookbacks. You can create even an ensemble of five, 10, 20. I mean, who knows? And there will be ones that are giving you high readings and ones that are giving you low readings. And maybe the real mean of the volatility is, is somewhere in between. And having that average will reduce your extremes. It will reduce the extremes of any of those individual one readings, which because it will tend to average higher because you'll have the spikes, um, it will probably reduce your risk. And that might be what you're looking for. I'm guessing, I'm, you know, that's just a guess. Yeah, you're, you're, you're dead on. And, and that's just the, the area I've been chewing on. And I don't see much research being done on it. Obviously it's very testable. And anytime you do a test, you're gonna see, okay, you know, this time it worked better, this time it worked worse. There's always trade-offs with everything. and that, it's just something I spend a lot of time thinking about whether you can do sort of a, an adaptive moving average approach to ATR so that you're getting sort of a, a blended approach to the weighting of the risk at the time of the trade. Uh, I, I understand it seems to be that, you know, go for a, whatever period works for you, just, just apply that. Um, but I'm just curious to open it up and see if other people are thinking about ATR um, in systematic ways like you're describing. Derek, do you think that um, that um, convergence strategies or, or regard to the mean strategies, as they have more uh, trades, they have a bigger sample size, uh, or you have to adjust that for the fact that they have those nasty um, left tails and you cannot say that they have a, a bigger sample size than, for example, trend following? a good question. Um, and I, I will say that, yes, uh, I do believe it has a net larger sample size. And I think the estimation of the tails difficulty is equal in trend following versus um, convergent strategies or divergent versus convergent. The only difference is your inability to estimate the right tail is far less important than your inability to estimate the left tail. And that's where people get tripped up. It's not necessarily that um, you might not have estimated it. It's just that, you know, you do have more data, but the importance of estimating it becomes higher. So maybe in the end, like, you know, they're equivalent because you will have a significant amount more trades, but your precision um, and your accuracy at estimating those tails also needs to go up by an order of magnitude. As, as someone who's, you know, trading at uh, statistical arbitrage that I was trying to make pennies on and trading through the flash crash, I'm going to disagree and say that there is a, a tremendous more risk in kind of a, uh, well, it depends on your frequency, I, I should clarify. But if you're doing an intraday statistical arbitrage, <laughs> there is is a much higher, if you want to talk about ATR of a spread that you normally trade, uh, you know, this thing, this thing went out to dollars um, during the flash crash. Um, so that relative is, I, I can't even imagine what would that, that would mean in say S&P futures. Um, it would be uh, maybe the S&P going to zero one day <laughs> and then coming back. So uh, there is a, a lot of risk on an intraday um, statistical arbitrage that you can't really get in a trend following, unless you're using leverage, of course. Would you mind expanding on your, your experience managing a statistical arbitrage strategy during something like the flash crash, you know, and how you were dealing with that and, you know, what kind of modeling you had before and maybe what changed after? I think it's a very interesting story. Sure. Um, as a lot of, uh, with that particular story and has happened several times during my career, um, I would say that I was a bit lucky in that I had a, a Vegas trip with the boys <laughs> planned where I was supposed to head out to the airport at, you know, one or two o'clock. So I had already lightened up my position for the day. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was 
basically trading around something or other for, you know, four cents, eight cents, and the spread of my synthetic went out over two dollars each, uh, you know, per spread. So, and it came in by the end of the day to, I want to say, thirty cents. You know, negative thirty cents. It went from negative over two dollars, maybe even three, to negative thirty cents. So it did end up uh, working well, and then you know the overnight trade would have worked well. Um, so I I would love uh, to tell a story of uh, sweat and heart palpitations, um, and it was all in the room around me. <laughs> um, but you know, the risk managers went over to several people and gently laid their hand on on their shoulder and said, you know, time to, time to step away. Um, but even with the flash crash, you know, the spread came back. So it, it you know, it ended up being a, a major, possibly the major mistake of, of, you know, my trading of that just because I, uh, I, I really should have, and I was younger and single and all this stuff, but, uh, I should have forsaken my Vegas trip. Um, I really could have made insane amounts of money in one day. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I, I kind of shortened the story. I could probably tell you more, more details, but, uh, that my personal story, I was sitting on the sideline and watching these numbers. It was an actual, uh, P and L, uh, for me. Yeah. When you talk about cents blowing up to dollars, like, okay, my level of like orders of magnitude was completely and utterly off. Like, I mean, factors of hundred X, uh, scary, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad you didn't have the heart palpitations though. It's not, it's not, it's not good for the self. It's not, not good for self care. I think our Vegas trip is probably better. <laughs> well, the Vegas trip was good, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a, honestly, if I had to do it all over again, even, I just didn't want to have to hold it overnight or over the weekend. I think it was overnight. No, it was over the weekend. Um, I didn't want to have to hold it, so I just didn't enter the trades. But I had it so lined up. I mean, could you imagine something that is, you know, I'm making four cents, eight cents on a good day, and, you know, I'm seeing $2, and I'm flat. You know, like I could have entered. I, I had it queued up, and I it, really stupidly, and, I, you know, we live life, and we can move around. But, no, if I had to do it. All over again, I would have definitely, uh, you know, for a day like that, I, I would have taken the heart palpitations, Derek, and, uh, you know, backed up, you know, even even half a position, I would have, you know, made, you know, years worth of p &L in one day. So, um, yeah, you know, I guess it's always nice to say the silver lining, but uh, no, if I had to do it uh, over again, I, I, I would I would be entering uh, the trade. Thanks for your words, though. I think that's quite interesting, um, the introspection on that, because of, you know, we're all humans behind these systems, and obviously statistical arbitrage is, uh, you know, high, highly quantitative. And the idea that, of course, like, it does sound like there's separate breadth, of course. Um, we as traders have that, you know, when, when it's a good trade, we wish we had more, and, and when it's a bad one, we wish we had less. But the idea that you were queued up in your system as a mean reversion system was ready to handle that and profit from that, I think it's the kind of key takeaway that we can get um, from this kind of thing, especially coming from you know, trend, more trend following backgrounds, that um, those blowouts are also opportunities. And that's a difference that uh, we don't really see in the trend following. When you have a stop out, like you're, you've got to wait for it to like go back and make a new trend. But in mean reversion, the worse it gets, the higher the levels of opportunity. And that's a complete mental reversal, you know, from the, from the other strategies. Another interesting aspect, which, uh, you know, I guess at this point, I'll just speak a little bit because it, it might apply to people is at that point, I was fresh out of graduate school, you know, fresh off a software job, um, you know, graduate school in statistics. So I was very programmatic and, you know, almost like a robot in setting my settings. You know, I, I often said, uh, you know, it was difficult, believe me, coming up with a, a trade that, uh, you know, worked 92% of days and, you know, profitable every month. It was tough, but 
after that, like just trading it, uh, at that point, I was so dogmatic and just automatic. And I said, a, a monkey could have done my job because I would just, you know, set it at four cents, eight cents. And, and it, it did. It, it didn't really suffer many big losses. Um, but then, since then, you know, I have a different uh, trade that I'm doing. And I've learned how to be a trader and use that human aspect, as, as you were talking about. And it... it I was the only uh, programmer in, in my office at the time, you know, and I, I wrote the fair value software and um, it was, but now I would be trading what I was trading much differently. Now that I understand things can happen, you know, and, and that the market is more of a living organism rather than, you know, a bunch of ones and zeros. So yeah, it, it, I would be trading that same arbitrage differently, and um, it, it really was a very interesting experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's super cool. Yeah, thanks. And that's that's actually a great example of the difference between um, uh, the difference that there is in in needle verting trades. And what was what Andy talked about is a you know, he he just made it sound like it was a, a you know nothing more than a game that he just uh, punched up on his computer. But you know it was a lot of uh, um, very advanced research and statistics that actually was deployed to markets in in, in different states of the world. And I have to sort of live through um, in all possible states of the world. Whereas something like you know carry or other mean reverting strategies are a lot less uh, uh, quantitative in nature, a lot less complicated to execute, a lot less uh, uh, reliant on certain assumptions at the outset. And yes, I mean they can go wrong, but uh, um, it, it's it, you can look at yield curves and and you can you can actually satisfy yourself that bond prices aren't jumping jumping up and down, um, you know, and going doing crazy things. They sort of still respect a relationship def broadly defined by yield curve. So you know, there's there's different levels of mean reversion, different levels of negatively skewed trades, different level levels of uh, uh, short gamma effectively strategies that can be deployed and very successfully without actually um, having to go for the you know, more advanced or you know, things that not everybody can do or could do. I'll also add, you know, hopefully it, it might help someone down the road with their uh, account management is that during the flash crash, and I, I don't want to go into specifics, um, you know, as I'm still talking with a, a few firms to, to reignite. Uh, but anyway, uh, things that were trading, you know, for a, a one or, you know, very tight spreads blew out to like 4% spreads. Like the market makers just disappeared. So you needed that, or I needed that human element. You know, at that point, if your program was written to reach across the aisle, you know, and, and hit the, the, you know, lift the spread, you know, the ask or hit the bid, you know, it, it wouldn't work. You know, there was a finesse involved that only a human could do. So you also have to realize that if there's an event like that, market makers, you know, are the, the turtle pulling their head inside the shell and what you are depending on might not be there to get out. Um, so that's, if, if I really had to impart one major lesson, it would be that, that market structure might not be what you think it is during a, a, a tumultuous time. But Andy, if, if that was the case, uh, and for example, there is a 4% spread that it's very out of the norm, would you refrain from trading? Uh, would you program your, your system to refrain from trading? Wouldn't that be much riskier to, to not do the trade at, at whatever the cost? Or, or would you uh, uh, wait for, the, for things to get normal, uh, expecting that normal will come again? I think you adapt, you know, and that's, that's uh, when I was, you know, I on the fly and you have to be able to, you know, respond under pressure and, 
on the fly, I had quickly written uh, uh, an algorithm you know, that was dancing around you know, where the ask was, you know, offering, um, you know, again, not trying to give too many details, but you have to adapt, um, I, you know, and that's why it's, you know, and even my current system, like I'm still, I don't trust the fully automation, automatic system. Um, maybe it's because of that, but, and that, that actually might be an interesting topic, Derek, for another time is, you know, the fully automated versus the gray box, like I'm very hesitant uh, to do a fully automated system um, because, you know, I, I saw this and you don't know where you were going to get executed, you know, and that, that was also a big reason why I didn't want to enter this, you know, over my Vegas trip is, you know, I just didn't want to have to deal with, you know, oh, did I get done? Oh, they canceled these trades. Like there, there is a human element that all your back tests are not going to show you. Thanks. I, I also noticed on, on, on mean reversion systems, like for example, um, ADRs versus single stocks or ADRs versus ETFs, that sometimes you accumulate a kind of risk that you didn't, uh, you didn't uh, account for at the beginning. For example, I remember uh, testing one, one system that uh, it ended up getting a lot of China risk. And that was something that I, I didn't see coming when I designed the, the system. And that was part of a, of a mean reversion system. I don't know if, if that is a, another layer of, of risk that you have to take into account when designing one of those. It's nice, nice to have someone, if, you know, or you can do it yourself, I guess. But, you know, I, you know I'm in a partnership with, you know, a lot of money and you know, he, he would sometimes lay that gentle hand on, on somebody's shoulder and just say, you know, that's, that's enough. <laughs> Luckily, it, it didn't happen to me, but you know, I watched it happen. Um, so it's a risk management system in place, but, you know, some, and you also, when you, you're, tra I'm a firm believer and you have to be conservative, you know, you have to take these things into consideration and, you know, build up your bankroll, start small and build up your bankroll because you don't know, you know, flash crash could happen tomorrow. You know, you, you, you don't know exactly what the limits are if you're not taking into consideration. And even at the flash crash, when did we have anything like that to back test, I guess? You know, with all this data, I was, I was you know, 87 did not have gonna be bad. that kind of this one data. Guy is fucking awesome. You know, available and, and you know, the spreads and because it's just different. You just have to start conservatively, and you know, as your profit grow, your size grow. Oh yeah, master degrees. This is this. I added. I tried to add him. I'm. I'm. I'm thinking. Yeah, now it's even different because they took some measures after the flash crash uh, in the circuit breakers, etc., which will make uh, the next uh, occurrence different than that one. Yep, they learn from the past too, but uh, you know, it could be like you know a, 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 a water bubble under saran wrap, and all right, you push it here, and it just pops up somewhere else that you couldn't have predicted. So uh, you know, I, I hear you. Um, I'm I'm still going to be fearful, and you know if that means I'm taking twenty percent less profits. Um, you know, that's okay with me. That's, that's conservative. You know, I think it's interesting, actually, um, going back to like cockroach theory, right? You know, um, you, we all have these edges. They all have some kind of like property and that we know. And then there's like the part we don't know. And almost in all situations, being more conservative to live the other day, um, you know, in either scenario is the way to go. Um, you know, and, and this comes back to like the idea of like finite versus infinite games. You know, um, I I do believe that you know Andy's approach, or or you know any any of us, uh, you know, try putting in a seat, putting on risk. <laughs> it's in the name. You know, we need to do risk management, right? And 
um, you know, someone, you know, your client or whatever will also have that same regret. You know, I had mentioned before, you know, why didn't you put more on and make more or why didn't you save me more when we're down and, you know, you could have put on less. And that's the, the human nature element of this whole thing. But, um, you know, being able to manage that and to live another day to to keep your seat, you know, quarter to quarter, year to year is is the most important piece, because if you don't have a seat at the table, none of what we discussed today matters at all. So true. You know, I think uh, Citadel is going to go for an IPO very soon. And, and once they open up their books, I think that's going to be something uh, interesting to see there. Uh, the trading, I think, one in four trades uh, on the U.S. markets today. So, And I think they've just sold a stake to Sequoia. People were a bit surprised by the valuation. They thought it was pretty low. I don't know whether it was low or high, but uh, you know, I think that's something that's going to be interesting uh, this year. You know, when Virtue did that, um, I was definitely on the case for trying to figure out what would come out of it. Um, I don't think I got anything out of it, to be honest. You get more from like, um, oh my gosh, uh, there was a time where I, I mean, okay, I, there, that I think an analyst uh, took, I forget what the firm was. Uh, it could have been Jump. It could have been um, one of the major market makers in Chicago. Uh, stole data and was sending it to uh, a firm overseas and then there was some litigation and of course they needed to you know make this was made public and in that i did find how they calculated the micro price uh between the bid ass spreads and that was something that i found like that was interesting but it is so hard like it is just not worth it to try to uh research legal documents to back engineer what people are doing. And then by the time you do it, they probably already adapted because they know it's out. Um, but I, I hope that it doesn't follow the, the, the virtue path because I mean, well, we also, we all saw what that, that it ended up. Yeah. And, and the one thing that scares me about these a lot, you know, I think um, in mean rewarding trades, uh, I think you need to, you need to automate things far more, than you need to do in say long term trend following or long term or even factor models and things like that. And uh, having seen a couple of firms like uh, Knight, I think it was Knight LLC, right, which which blew up, it was ultimately bought by one of the other uh, market makers. So you know, I mean, one glitch that just blows you up. It it doesn't sound very reassuring. So. So it becomes like a really important, like, you know, whether uh, what is your edge really in, in these games is uh, is something that, that I wonder about. Is it is it technology? Is it your uh, ability to, you know, get programmers or, you know, how closest are you to the exchange and things like that? Are you going to get servers close to the exchange? So it, I don't know what, that's, that's a very different game from... Uh, from uh, you know what we do, I I feel like I'd like to um, clarify that you know zoom it out a little bit that all mean reverting trades are not necessarily intraday trades. Um, you know I'm, I'm I'm always researching and you know might be working on a you know I've seen pairs trades overnight you know or one day trades I've I've seen them work as well, you're not gonna get that same level of um, control, certainly, and you know, good luck sleeping. But uh, it, it, I, I've seen pair trade systems seem to work and you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of dabbling with one that seems to work. Um, so it's not necessarily, doesn't need to be system, you know, highly programmed. Anish, I just wanted to point that out, you know, just to kind of expand everyone's uh, mind on, on what you could be looking for. There, it, it could work in a lower frequency. You got it. Yeah, no, we, I, I've been looking at some pair trades on and off. I've dabbled with that. And uh, some of them uh, are actually go on for quite some time. You know, they go on for like even sometimes a couple of weeks before... Uh, but the edge that uh, I mean, I've read about all these guys in the in the 80s and 90s, the 
PDG team within Morgan Stanley where Peter Muller and his team used to sort of develop that engine and then one of the guys left and joined Ed Thorpe and then even Ed Thorpe I think in the 2000s he found sort of his edge was uh, rapidly receding and uh, even though he and then he managed an account again for another guy he went and sort of again redid his system and again came back but it seems like a, like a uh, endeavor where you also have to keep on con- continuously uh, uh, i don't know uh, looking at your systems and trying to optimize them also quite a bit i don't know if I, if that's uh, accurate i mean i i think so you know i that's that's kind of you know a tributary if you will of of you know my my main lesson is yeah you know like i was so rigid in what i had created that i had you know very specific um i i i wasn't adapting my system really to you know the various volatilities um of of the markets so um you know that 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 in the end you know my first two years of trading were 2008 and 2009 <laughs> so Uh, you know, as a computer programmer who didn't understand the market, come 2010, I, you know, to me it's, and to all of us, it's obvious. Like, okay, you know, cowboy, you're not going to be getting eight cents, you know, on the same trade because the volatility of the market is done. But um, if I would have, you know, constantly been improving my system and looking around, like, it's so obvious to me that, you know, I'd still be, making hand over fist for four cents, which was a lot, you know, it was so consistent. Um, just that one adjustment probably would have, you know, uh, really, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I, it, the thing still works. So um, you, you do need to constantly have that eye out for improvements. So I, Speaking I from ignorance, because it's really something I, I don't do and I haven't, and I've never done, um, in equities. Uh, I was a bit active in, in credit. Um, but it seems to me like mean reverting and pass trading in equities has this, this scale problem. If you want to play at shorter time frames, you have to have you know, execution capabilities, which means you know, effectively hardware issues and you know, not just you know, how, to, how you program your systems and being very sophisticated down to you know, um trying to, to to train execution time for your um for your ex- for your trade execution program so you know it, it's that efficient and you know so on one hand you have this problem if you step back a few time frames and, and go for you know the a couple of days or even a couple of weeks um spread trading you are then inevitably faced with a funding issue because obviously most of the money you made you make in today is because you know you can trade on no capital so technology but if as you step out you need to fund your trades because t plus three and all that so isn't it true basically the question is isn't it true that you are constantly battling with this problem and you know you have to have a lot of capital for technology if you're playing the small time frames and you have to have a bit of capital for funding if you're playing the higher time frames absolutely you know and that's It's, I mean, I'm, yes, you, you absolutely do. And that's, that's my, why I'm not running this particular strategy at this moment um, is exactly that. And it's not just that there's infrastructure on how much are you paying per trade? And that's, you're not going to get that. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, I have connections. I'm not going to get what I was getting, you know, when I'm trading, you know, tens of millions of shares a day, you know, I'm just not getting, and it's huge, especially if you're going down to making three or four cents a trade, you know, your execution cost is important and that comes from a relationship. So really, I don't think there's, it, it, it's a huge disadvantage for an individual and it's, um, you need, in my opinion, you need to partner with someone with a huge bankroll Not only that, but technology, infrastructure, and not only that, but a relationship with, you know, the clearing 
company that's going to, you know, allow you to have X amount of leverage. And, you know, and man, the cheapest execution costs you can possibly get. Yeah, I think that, you know, all of those kind of hurdles is, is probably why this level of, you know, you mean reversion trading or statistical arbitrage isn't really discussed that much on the internet because most people, most internet people, I don't know how to classify them, don't have that ability. <laughs> And, you know, but it does leave the less frequent, you know, the, the overnight trades, um, you know, it does leave those open, but that's, that's not, it's so nice. So nice having a repeatable, it's like, you know, just a warm blanket, um, you know, and then you're very often, most of the time out, you know, overnight. But you still have a um, trade sizing, funding, however you want to call it. You, you do have to be careful about um, you know the, the risk you leave open in the market because you know if you're not properly collateralizing it, um, you can blow up, and that's basically the biggest risk I see in, in those strategies, obviously, besides my own influence of the space. So, you know, I wish I wish I knew more. But if I had to think about, um, you know, trading it, even from a perspective of a small independent, probably not quite retail side, but um, a, a, a small financial institution, you do need to make sure that you have, you know, collateral very available to support, you know, um, some you know, unusual movement in spreads because you know we talked about flash crash, but um, I don't know what would have happened, for example, over you know over uh, Black Friday in, in some of those spread trades because you know everything went a little bit crazy and if they catch you out and they liquidate you, that's it, it's game over for you. There's also the the you know I, I don't know if you want to call it uh, selling options or or you know staking a you know, 300 to one bet that Cam Akers is going to be the Super Bowl MVP. But there's there's a big difference. You know, we talk a lot in Jerry's room about diversification. Well, the risk manager at a firm has diversification over however many traders he has. So, you know, that's that's the risk manager's job. And that's why a single individual, you can have a bad day and you'll be done. Yeah. You'll be you won't be able to <laughs> trade anymore because you ran out of money. But if you take that, um, <laughs> I, I want to use the term ATR, but use it as far as the the ATR of drawdown per trader, and then if you spread that out across twenty traders in a room, the odds that all twenty of them are going to be at that ATR is slow, so other traders can absorb. Especially, you know, you don't want 20 traders trading the same thing, you know, so you have a diversification of, you know, the traders trading that their risk, you know, so it, it I, I don't see how it gets done without being at a firm of multiple traders, you know, well capitalized. I, I, I you know, it's all points supporting that it's not for the individual investor. And I think that is is interesting as well, you know, considering the structure of your of, of firms uh, that do this, you know, and being able to diversify, you know, coming from the you know the PM's perspective or the trader's perspective, you are focusing on what you do, and you know a lot of these questions, you know, that come up here about like mixing it in and how much percentage you can allocate because maybe the implied leverage is too high, um, does fall away because you're already part of a portfolio, you're part of a firm that is executing a diversified set of things and it as a firm already has um, multiple return streams. And that is something that individual people um, who, who have never you know, been on a floor or, or understand how that works or 
um, the way that the firm is set up is such that they are operating the portfolio from you know the top down level and have to allocate inside that portfolio multiple uh, sorry multiple return streams and then you are like the trader slash risk manager in like the multi strategy sense but not only is the hurdle rate uh, the moat the, the economic moat around this thing um, extremely difficult but to assume that you can just do this one thing in that kind of structure um, and not be diversified uh, is is really of chief importance, you know, and it doesn't matter the strategy. And, you know, I think that when Andy was saying like the ATR of the drawdown or like these max drawdown, daily drawdowns of, of different people, um, in the end game, you know, the firm itself is a multi-strategy manager managing these different traders. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's really interesting to think about, but, you know, and it is, it's their money, you know, in, 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 in my case, you know, it's a private partnership, it's their money and they're just, we're the stock market, we're the, the long futures, short, you know, whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it's almost a perfect, uh, you know, multi time frame uh, chart, you know, where, where, uh, yeah, it, it, that they look at us like a portfolio. All right, guys. I mean, we're about an hour and 20 minutes in. Um, I guess I'll leave it open quickly for if we want to move on to another topic or we can close it down. I'm good. I'm going to do my little pre-market rituals here. Thanks a lot, Derek. I appreciate it. It's nice. It, uh, nice to have this room. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for for being here, Andy. I love how spontaneous um, the conversation was today and how it you know, led down and you were able to share your stories and we were all kind of able to learn a lot from you. So um, thank you, Andy. And you know, I, I hope it sets a good precedent um, for the kind of you know, great uh, discourse that we can have here uh, when people share their own personal experiences that gives us a different view on the markets. So that will be all for today's uh, Quant Brainstorm. Thank you, everyone. I will do my best to figure out how to put this thing on YouTube and see if my recording worked. Uh, catch you guys all next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. 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 Thank Thanks. you, everyone.